Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Nature has seemingly solved a significant astronomical question that arose early last year in an event known as Betelgeuse's Great Dimming. Betelgeuse is a relatively famous red supergiant star that's actually quite close to Earth, only 724 light years away, making it the second closest red supergiant to our planet. During the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, this star started darkening quite suddenly, with astronomers unable to confidently conclude exactly why. Well now, a team of astronomers using the Very Large Telescope, or VLT, in Chile have come up with two primary conclusions to explain this event. Either a large, cool spot had arisen on the surface of the star, or a cloud of dust had formed right next to it, obscuring some of its light from reaching Earth. The dimming had caused some to theorise that perhaps Betelgeuse was getting closer to supernova, an event which many look forward to, as it will be nearly as bright as a half moon in our sky and be visible for several months. However, it's believed Betelgeuse is many thousands of years off going into supernova, for now. In other news, another follow-up, this time from last week's news that NASA had announced their mission to Venus. The ESA has followed suit, announcing a probe they've called Envision, which will study the planet hot enough to melt lead. Both space agencies will be cooperating in their three missions to Venus, with a member of the team telling BBC News that all three of the missions are highly complementary, with Envision looking to land in the mid-2030s, slightly later than its American counterparts. All of the missions will be looking particularly at why Venus, despite being of similar size, is so different to Earth, and if it was even more similar. And now over to Ben, with some paleontology news. Thanks, Doug. Also this last week has been some more incredible Australian paleontology news, with the naming and description of a new genus and species of prehistoric crocodiliform, Gunga Marandu Maunala. Dating to sometime between 2 and 5 million years old, this animal is based on an incomplete skull that indicates a full body length of around 7 metres, larger than the biggest saltwater crocodiles, making this the biggest crocodilian known to have inhabited Australia. Interestingly though, it's actually very closely related to the living false gharial, being a member of the same subfamily, Tomistomine. This is significant since before now it had been thought that the only crocodilians to live in Australia during the Cenozoic had been members of the extinct Mecosucane, including genera such as Quincana, and two species of crocodilus. But the discovery of Gunga Mirandu shows that Tomistamine crocodilians were present here as well, making this the southernmost occurrence of this lineage. A truly incredible discovery, Australia really just does not disappoint when it comes to extinct animals. Also in the news are a couple more newly named prehistoric reptiles. First up, a new plesiosaur from Portugal. Coming from lower Jurassic rocks in the central west of the country, it's based on a partial skeleton and has been named Plesiopharis moalensis. Its evolutionary placement has been found to be near the base of the superfamily Plesiosauroidea, based on its combination of unique skeletal characteristics. Additionally, it is now the most complete and oldest plesiosaur species to be found so far in the Iberian Peninsula, as well as helping to further illustrate how marine reptiles spread into this region with the opening of the newly formed Proto-Atlantic Sea. And finally is the naming of a new ichthyosaur, Catutosaurus gasparinae, from the Upper Jurassic of Argentina. This is a very interesting animal in terms of ichthyosaur evolution, as it's classified as a basal or thalmosaurid, a very widespread and successful group of these marine reptiles, and displays a skull similar to one grouping within this clade, while its forefin is more like those of members of a different ophthalmosaurus grouping. What this means is that the evolution of these parts of the skeleton, which are clearly important and functions vital to the success of the animals, occurred independently within ophthalmosaurids and not in a stepwise fashion as the group evolved. So, another significant discovery that better adds to our understanding of how these remarkable creatures evolved. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you, Ben. Well, that's it for this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed and we'll see you soon. Where did you put it? I don't know. Do you think they'd tell me? I know they would. Ah! Ah! Where did they put it? They're taking it east. To some museum. That's all I know. Damn it.